Okay, we're here with my friend and fellow media law geek, <laughs> Chip Stewart. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, why don't you just give a brief introduction of yourself and the case that you want to talk about today? Sure. Um, so uh, my name is Chip Stewart. I'm a professor at Texas Christian University where I teach uh, media law and ethics courses. I was a lawyer um, before I went back and got my PhD. Um, and before all that, I was a journalist. I started as a sports writer. So sports uh, journalism, then law school, then uh, a regular newsroom, and then off to teaching and, uh, and writing and uh, working in media law. Um, and let's see, I, uh, I'd like to talk today about uh, Campbell versus Acuff Ro Rose Music, um, Supreme Court case from the 1990s about uh, fair use and copyright. All right, certainly an area that's uh, difficult for a lot of people to understand, feels like the goalposts are always moving. Um, and uh, who doesn't want to do a case that's about two live crew? And Roy Orbison. <laughs> and, and, and parody. Uh, that's something that um, it's funny because one, you know, this is dating myself a bit, but Two Live Crew was when I was in high school was like the most dreaded music of parents. <laughs> so the terrified parents would have been, of course, as high schoolers, we all had it and listened to it all the time. Um, this was like the soundtrack of um, you know my football bus rides and that sort of stuff. So um, and this sort of stuff came out what. Like uh, I think as nasty as they want to be came out 1990 uh, or so mm -hmm. um, and caused a lot of problems at, even outside of the, the fair use and copyright context. Of course, uh, Luther Campbell and some of the two live crew were arrested for obscenity in Florida. They weren't acquitted, uh, but this was at a time where uh, people, well, some people were really cracking down and making political statements about um, uh, about the content of this music. Yeah, in very in a very paternalistic way, right? <laughs> that, that you know, it's like our young minds were just just going to be trashed by this. But by today's standards, some of this stuff looks pretty tame. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, when we think about it now, that if things had turned out differently in 1990, 1991, which you know, if uh, the government had been able to get away with some of these obscenity prosecutions, um, then music would be very different now. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that stuff uh, really came to a head in the late '80s. Uh, and the warning labels you see on music now, they started up you know, around the late 80s as well, uh, some of the industry self-regulation. Yeah, and some of the connections between obscenity and violence, I think, would have affected not just what we see artistically with music today, but with other kinds of art as well, certainly with you know, film and theater, so you know, wide-ranging, wide-ranging implications. All right, so tell us why you picked the Campbell as, your, as one of your top cases. Um, well, it's uh, it's one of the only times the Supreme Court has taken a copyright in recent years, and I think that's really important. Um, and besides just the subject matter, I think it's uh, you know it's kind of fun that these musicians, Roy, you can't imagine people more different. Roy Orbison, uh, who we know from singing the song "Pretty Woman," um, and of course was in the or "Oh, Pretty Woman" was his version of the song, um, and was in the Traveling Wilburys at the time. So this this nice old singer, you know, um, respected, you know, ultimately rock and roll Hall of Famer. Um, and then the two live crew, which is a, you know, a, a, about as, a, from some perspectives, about as contemptible a music act as a, you can find uh, mm -hmm. in the United States in the early 1990s, um, cross paths in this way. And, um, and it's j just a lot of the facts that are interesting, but uh, I, it's hard to think of a more important copyright case the Supreme Court has decided. Um, this is the case that established once and for all the value of a transformative um, Findings on the first factor of the of the fair use analysis, and that is really the reason that ca that uh, people find fair use most often is that something is transformative. This is where the Supreme Court laid out that test. Yeah, so let's talk about that. So, what is it? You know, under the Campbell um, decision, what does that mean? What what? How do we look at transformative uses now? Uh, the way I like to talk about this is um, creating something new from something old. Um, so you take something that's already there and copyrighted and you do not need permission to do it. That's one of the important things about this case. You don't need permission. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, Two Life Crew asked permission from A. Cuff Rose Music, the rights holders for this, and they said no. Right. You do not do a cover version or parody version of our song, and they went and did it anyway. And the Supreme, Supreme Court mentioned this, and you could look at it and say, well, that might be bad faith, right? They asked, they got denied. That's not the way fair use works, that you don't have to have permission for fair use, uh, to claim fair use. So, um, so I think that's a really important one here. A really important factor but this idea of transformation where you take old things uh remix them repackage them do something new with them and create something new from that something old in a way that doesn't harm the market of the original um and doesn't just replace the original but does something um 
new or almost entirely new. And this doesn't, this does, uh, in this case, it's in the context of parody. Yeah, and let's talk more about parody. Um, so this is something that, um, you know, a lot of, it's a mistake I think a lot of people make that parody is across the board protected. So anything that you can claim as a parody could never give rise to a copyright suit. Right, um, and there's a, you know, the, the court sets up this balance here, right? Where they, they say, uh, you know, what it's like for something to be a parody what counts as the parody and where it might go too far and it crosses over into a cover. So if you think of it, it's like a, it's, it's almost like a spectrum, right? And, and you start from um, just a straight cover is obviously going to be copyright. You're just playing the same music, the same lyrics, mm -hmm. that's going to be copyright. Right? And, um, and so they start to look and say, well, what are the facts going to be like that can, where you transform it into something new? And, uh, and I like the way the court looks at this. They say um, it, a, a parody is, uh, you, know, you have to have enough of the original song to, uh, to, to draw up the idea of the original. So people actually know it's a parody. Mm -hmm. so they know that you're doing criticism or court commentary of the original or something in society, something like that. So you have to have enough of the original so people know it's a parody, but not so much that uh, that you're actually doing a cover. And this is, and the, and the two live crew version of Pretty Woman is, you know, kind of really walks tightly along that line where they do, you know, the same first verse, the same bass line, um, and then it veers wildly off into new and different directions after right. that. So that the two are, you know one is referring to the other, but they're very clearly not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that the the listener can be can sense the difference between the two, can sense the, senses the connection to know that it's a parody, but can find the difference between the two. What else do you think is uh, are things that are, you know, maybe misunderstood about this case in particular? Um, well, we've talked about the idea of whether you need permission, um, I would say the question I get the most about this when I talk about it is, what about Weird Al? You know, so if, if y'all are familiar with Weird Al. That is, it is the number one media law <laughs> course question about this. And, he, and boy, he has staying power. You would think that nobody would still be talking about it, but they are. And, and he's still here, right? He just played a, a concert down uh, here in the, in the Dallas area um, last year, I think. So, uh, so what about Weird Al? And the facts on that are Weird Al always gets permission. In fact, most artists really like when Weird Al does a parody of them because it's good for them. Mm -hmm. It shows they're kind of a good sport and actually is supposed to, the thought is that it actually helps their publicity and helps their song. And also would look really bad if they did, if they were mean to Weird Al because everybody loves Weird Al. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, we're on like three generations of people loving Weird Al at this point. You know, he started his career in the late 70s. He's right. Still around. Um, but he always gets permission. Um, but the fact is he probably doesn't need to uh, because he's doing a parody that's you know, he does just enough music, but, you know, sometimes he's playing it on different instruments, like an accordion. Um, so, so he's playing it on different instruments, but the tune is there, but the, but the song, the lyrics are so much uh, different. Um, and the purpose of them is clearly parody. I don't know if he would need permission. He just goes and gets it anyway, and people seem to uh, willingly give it to him. Yeah. I think uh, copyright, you know, fair use... It's, it feels like the ground is always shifting. It's hard for students you know, um, to understand how this all works. What do you think are some of the most common myths about copyright or you know, things that we get wrong about copyright? Well, the first is um, I found it on the internet for free so I can use it. Yeah. <laughs> um, or if, I, if I'm using it not for money, then that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Also not true. So you know, if you want to go do a cover song of you know, a music artist you like, and you go play it in, for example, we have a pop belly sandwiches here. Do you all have pop belly? We don't. Sandwiches. Um, and uh, they would have local musicians come in and play songs. And sometimes they play their original songs that looks like sit in the corner with guitar. They'll play songs and then they'll play cover songs as well. Um, technically that's copyright. They should have a license either. Pop belly is a, you know, an arena needs a license or a, uh, or the musician needs a, you know, a license or permission. To oh, you said pot belly. Yes, we do have pot belly, but we, I thought you said pop Ellie. I don't know if I was like thinking pop music. I'm not sure. Yes, we do have them. Um, yeah, so te technically copyright infringement. We're playing this music. You really need a license for that. That is copyright infringement. Are you likely to be you know, uh, sued for it? Probably not, but you could. Mm -hmm. uh, or more likely pot belly could because they're doing this at all the restaurants. There might be some money there. Um, so that's one of the things that, you know, even if you're not doing it, for money for a performance, you just want to record it and put it up on YouTube, your own version of it. Guess what? That's copyright infringement. Right. Um, I found it for free on the internet. Yes, that's also copyright infringement. Um, but I, I think also this idea of permission that um, you know it's important to remember that fair use doesn't require permission. Permission is safe. You know, having a license, having permission 
uh, is important. That's going to avoid copyright lawsuits for you later on if you you'll know, follow whatever the limits are of your permission. Um, but uh, if you're transforming something, if you've got fair use of it, you don't have to have permission. Um, that's the point of fair use. So you're not having to go in and, and check the boxes in, in front of this, uh, 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 you know, to build on, you know, to create something new or to build on previous works. Yeah, I think, and, and a truly important, and, and I, th I think sometimes overlooked element of the Campbell case is that idea that, you know, it is not decisive that permission was denied and they went ahead anyway. I think that's really important. I, I, one of my favorite myths is from all our fellow educators, which is that an educational use is automatically a fair use. Oh, and, sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> like if I were to come in here and play um, the entirety of the Roy Orson song and the entirety of the uh, Two Live Crew song for educational purposes, um, I could at least go and make an argument that that's an educational use. Mm -hmm. um, but if they wanted to sue me saying that's not a fair use, you use too much on uh, um, the amount of substantiality, it was unnecessary. Um, I think it at least would get past the summary judgment stage. You know, yeah. I think that if, at least we'd have to go to trial over it. And um, and whereas you're playing a clip, you know, only a little portion of it, not for profit, for an educational purpose, probably would be fine. That's why we don't just screen movies in class. Um, unless we've got them from the library, and the library gives us a license for that. You're not just supposed to show whole movies. Clips are going to be fine. Right. Right. And I think it's also not one of the just the most misunderstood things, but one of the most frustrating things is that, you know, we talk all the time about good law is predictable. It's, you know, you know when, you know when you're, you're on one side of the law and you know when you're on the other. And I think fair use, at least in the media law context, is the area where we have the least predictability. You just don't know. One way I like to think about fair use is it's the, uh, you know, fair use is really just something you can claim once you've been sued. Right. You know, that, that I guess you, you could go and sue for a declaratory judgment claiming something to be, be fair use. Either way, you don't know if it's fair use or not until a court tells you it is. Exactly. Uh, so, and that costs money to find out. You, either you're sued or you're filing for relief. So, um, but you know that costs the other person to sue you for uh, for infringement as well. Just the equities on these things, the damages can really escalate pretty high. Mm -hmm. um, the minimum statutory damages and attorneys fees on the uh, um, on the plaintiff side. So, there's incentive to sue and shut these sorts of things down, um, and not as much of uh, an incentive to go and defend yourself rather than just settle to make it go away. Right, and that brings up something that has just become, just popped really high on my radar in the last two years, and that's um, these copyright trolls. These oh, yeah. firms that are just out trying to net cases. And I had a really difficult one with a, um, uh, with a recent graduate who um, yeah, a troll firm came after him. He had done his own little personal portfolio website and he had screenshotted different um, stories that he had done for different outlets. The outlets had licensed the photos, of course, to run the story, but he had not licensed them for his screenshots. And they came after him, and um, and he took them down immediately. Didn't hadn't realized it was a problem. That wasn't enough to satisfy them. He ended up paying. They want to pay a license. Yeah, we had that happen with our student media here. We had a student pull down what she thought was a Creative Commons photo. It was a Creative Commons photo, but it was a uh, an attribution license. She just used it as a uh, as a thumbnail to click through on a story with no art. So it doesn't. It's not even on the story. It's only on the web page to click through to get to the story. It was just like a little bit of stock, you know, stock photo, mm -hmm. you know, uh, prescription or like little pills. Um, and uh, she got a you know a, a, a demand for a license uh, saying, hey, we noticed you used this without our permission. Even though it's Creative Commons, you didn't attribute properly. So pay seven hundred fifty dollars. Um, and rather than, you know, that's one of those where we could have hired lawyers, paid 10 grand, gone to court, fought, and hoped to get a good, um, you know, finding on fair use, um, or we could pay, we end up negotiating and get down to about $500 and just paid it. Like, let's just make this go away. Yep. Um, and there are more and more people that this artist posted on a Creative Commons attribution license, but he did it on the 2.0 license or the 3.0 license, um, which does not have a correction thing. So the 4.0 license, which has been in use since 2013, right. I'll put this up, says if you correct within 30 days, then you're not in violation of the license. So we just could have attributed it. Well, right. they don't use that license. They use the one they can sue you under. Um, so it's almost like they're, they're throwing it out there. They're searching for the photos they can find people to sue because people aren't licensed. Nobody's buying it. Nobody's paying them. Right. They're getting them from lawsuits. Right. And how did I know this? I went to Pacer and looked it up. This guy's filed 26 lawsuits in, uh, or 27 lawsuits in 2019 alone. So this is how he makes his money.
I know, and it's it's truly unfortunate. So I think, you know, best practice as we as we work with student media and others is to say, look, the, where you want to start is a Creative Commons four. That anything anything beyond that, you really could run into people who have these sort of pernicious um, intentions, and they're they're trying to trap you into it. But at some point, I, I agree with you. What I was saying to this young alum is, you know, because he was just feeling very you know, like this is wrong, and I've got to fight this. I said, yeah, it is wrong, and I understand the instinct to fight, but it's going to cost you a whole ton more in attorney's fees, even if you prevail, than, than you know, paying to settle. It's really an unfortunate, unfortunate element. And maybe something that we'll see uh, end up, you know, that some sort of class action against um, copyright trolls. Who knows? At some point, we could see something that would help people. One thing not to do, I, I found a lawsuit that was dismissed re recently if somebody got this demand and she filed a lawsuit against the company and the firm claiming damages. Uh, she tried to uh, sue them for RICO, uh, for racketeering, uh, mm. and uh, for violating, uh, you know, uh, deceptive trade practices law in New York, and the court uh, dismissed both. Oh, so, darn. So well, that's not going to work. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's not our option. The requirements are very clear on the website. You know, that we're not saying it's deceptive when the language is right there. You've just got to read it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what is the lasting importance of the Campbell case today? What are one or two things that really matter in 2020? Sure. Um, again, the, the, the transformation or transformativeness aspect of it is still the most important thing you can do in a fair use case today, that if you can show it's transformative, you are way more likely to win your case. Um, and the, there was a study that was done about 10 years ago that said, yeah, it was like 90% of cases that prevail on fair use are able to show it's transformative. You know, so this is the, that, that number one factor, if you can show transformativeness, um, that's the way to win these cases. And that was established um, in, in the Campbell case. So um, just this value, man, it's been applied to so many things besides music, um, to, uh, to photography, to art, to sculpture, to other things like this, um, so that it uh, you know, provides some protection. And some, I think it even pushes, some of the cases since then have really pushed um, beyond what I would think would be fair use. Um, some courts, particularly Ninth Circuit and Seventh Circuit, have been a, um, a bit more um, protective of secondary uses of uh, finding transformation where you know, I thought it might be a, a, little, um, a little harder to find. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the big one. Uh, and the other one, as I mentioned before, is that, uh, that uh, not needing permission um, is it, just really important to remember about fair use. But the most important thing is that transformativeness on the first factor is, you know, while there's technically no one factor that's greater than the others, you right. have to take on a case by case basis, that sort of stuff. Uh, that's a big one. Yeah. I guess one other thing we hadn't really talked about is market harm or market values for the fourth factor. Uh, the court really did pay attention to that as well. And they looked at this and they said, oh, come on. If there's no market harm. <laughs> if anything, it helped your market because it reminded people this original song is out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're going to show market harm, you better come with facts showing that you lost money on it. And just that you lost the ability to license it to this company isn't enough. You've got to show actual harm to your original market. And that's a really important factor too. Yeah. All right, well, Chip, this was fascinating. I'd love to go go back to the two live crew, you know, like back to my youth. <laughs> um, this was just great. I was say, everybody, so you can go home and listen to two live crew or don't. Um, <laughs> I did not tell you to do that. Um, at least that another thing to remember is that this song is only on the As Clean As They Want To Be album. So it did, it's not on the as nasty as they want to be. They made a, a special, like, safer for radio play version that you could buy and a little more centered. It's on that one. So if you want a yeah. cleaner version of the two live crew, it, this song will be on there. All right. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much, Chip. I really appreciate you doing this. And, and uh, I know the students are really going to enjoy watching it.